Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those of you in Tokyo who are joining us. Uh, my name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA, and we're so excited to have you with us today for our policy briefing, U.S.-Japan Pandemic Preparedness Cooperation. Uh, this is featuring Dr. Matthew Donahue, uh, Ms. Catherine Evans, Ms. Natalie DeGraff, and Dr. Sakamoto, uh, Haruka Sakamoto. And uh, they will be speaking about their recent uh, Sasakawa USA Emerging Experts Delegation trip uh, to Japan to learn about uh, Japan's public health um, work and their uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so as you may know, Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening relationships between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Um, as you may know, today's event is on the record and is being recorded. A recap and video of this event will be available on our website in the coming weeks. Also, uh, we will have time for a Q&A later in this session, and you can submit your questions at any time uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we look forward to that engaging discussion with all of you. And with that, I'd like to turn it to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Thank you, Shanti. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Thank you very much for joining us today. Our lives have been greatly affected by COVID-19 for almost three years. While there seems to be different views as to when and where COVID-19 viruses originated, there is a strong consensus that it is a global issue that requires internationally coordinated measures, in addition to nationally based measures. However, as we have witnessed, international community have been capable of coordination only on a limited basis, despite great efforts of multilateral institutions and the mechanisms, such as World Health Organization. I am delighted Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA helped a group of American pandemic experts visit Japan this summer to meet with Japanese counterparts at the highest level of Japanese government, ministries, medical communities, and the local experts, particularly in Kanagawa. They exchanged views on how the US and Japan try to battle COVID-19 within their respective borders what the US and Japan can learn from each other from the, the, from the two countries' respective experience, and what the US and Japan can do to prepare to most effectively prevent the next pandemic disease from devastating the entire world, like the COVID-19 did to all aspects of our lives. We have many Japanese experts who the delegation met in Japan in attendance today. Thank you very much for joining us, despite the fact that it's late, late at night in Tokyo. I would like to acknowledge some experts who are so kind to help the delegation uh, while they are in Tokyo. Dr. Norihiro Kokudo, President, National Center for Global Health and Medicine. Dr. Hiroshi Yotsuyanagi, President, Japanese Association for Infectious Diseases. Dr. Yamaguchi of CIDR, uh, Osaka University. I am thrilled to have three members of Sasakawa USA see the delegation this morning. Two of them work at the federal level and one of them work at, works at the state level. Dr. Matthew Donahue is internal medicine physician, state epidemiologist, Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Donahue will present his takeaways from the trip mainly from the local viewpoint. Ms. Kathleen Evans is interdisciplinary scientist, division of requirements, administration for strategic preparedness and response, US Department of Health and Human Services. Ms. Evans will talk about national level observations based on her trip to Japan and a little bit about the US-Japan cooperation in the future. 
Ms. Natalie de Graff is bio lead and the program analyst, Division of Strategy, Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Ms. Graff will talk about her findings and views regarding the U.S.-Japan Future Cooperation. Dr. Haruka Sakamoto, Associate Professor, Global Health Section, Department of Hygiene and Public Health, Tokyo Women's Medical University is our commentator. Dr. Sakamoto, one of the experts whom the delegation members met in Tokyo, will make comments on and respond to remarks by three US speakers, as well as present her views. So Dr. Donahue, please take away. All right, I think we're in business. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, appreciate the kind introduction, Dr. Akimoto. I'm very, very excited to be back with this group again uh, and really thankful to have been invited back. I've, I've spent some time reflecting on my involvement with SEED and Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I'm happy to share a summary of those reflections this morning. In my role as state epidemiologist at Nebraska, I've tried to borrow as many good ideas from national and international leaders as possible. Effective response measures, clear communications, and modern surveillance tools. New York developed excellent cluster detection models that we borrowed. Australia helped teach Nebraska how genomic epidemiology could inform pandemic response measures. And Japan crafted one of the best public health communications in the world, in my opinion. So my intent on joining Sasakawa Emerging Experts Public Health Delegation was twofold. I wanted to dig more deeply into Japan's public health successes to identify response measures that could be reproduced and applied in Nebraska. And then I also wanted to form and maintain connections for more rapid international communications and knowledge sharing both during and between pandemics. So prior to SEED, I was aware of Japanese public health response in four primary points regarding COVID response. The first was Diamond Princess. After helping set up traveler screening at LAX airport, and after completing the case investigation contact tracing for the third case in the US, I returned to Nebraska and began working on an, on an active monitoring system uh, and adapting it for COVID-19, since we knew Diamond Princess patients would be coming at some point soon. In preparation for seeing cases, we needed to have a place, a system in place to monitor healthcare workers who would care for patients with COVID-19. And soon we received those passengers from Diamond Princess, 13 of them, and our healthcare worker active monitoring system was ready and we used it and it was successful. So we subsequently implemented it for our community, for community exposure statewide. And I think our state was likely a bit more ready than other states because of that early experience with the Diamond Princess. The next point that I learned about Japan prior to SEED was the three C's, the three C's public education campaign. While masking guidance and close contact definitions were debated over in the US, there was this clever, simple, evidence-based communication campaign that emerged from Japan, which was called the three C's. It urged the public to avoid close environments, crowded conditions, and close contact settings to limit COVID-19 transmission. And through summer and fall in 2020, Nebraska incorporated that excellent Japanese tool into our own public health response. And we communicated that tool through all levels of government and public health. And at a time where transmission was rapidly increasing and public health guidance wasn't always clear, the three C's filled a substantial gap even here in Nebraska and filled it well. The third topic was retrospective or reverse contact tracing. Contact tracing served to identify others who were exposed and warn them of that exposure. If you could warn them, you could direct them to quarantine and monitor them for symptoms. And if individuals are quarantining when they develop illness, then the transmission chain is broken. And that's the whole goal. So normally we try to identify everyone exposed by the interviewed patient going forward in time. And reverse or retrospective contact tracing, which Japan pushed forward, did the opposite. You look backward in time to figure out how that case got COVID-19 to begin with. And when a source of infection could be identified, that source might be a super spreading event where a ton of people were infected. And if those exposed through a super spreading event could be notified of their exposures in quarantine, 
then a substantial number of transmission chains would be broken. And a quick example of this is a wedding. Perhaps I'm interviewing a person with COVID-19. And normally in the US, I'd ask them who they were in contact with since they became sick and forward trace those people to warn them of exposure. In Japan, you would also try to find out where that person got sick from. And you would learn that that person was likely exposed themselves at a wedding. Then you go back to that wedding, warn others of their likely exposure. And by going back in time through retrospective or reverse tracing and notifying everyone at that original event, you could prevent even more infections. And at times we were able to use that strategy in Nebraska to good effect. The final category I was aware of, uh, of Japanese response prior to traveling was regarding the success around vaccinations and around mortality. Prior to traveling to Japan, I compared Nebraska and Japan vaccination proportions and mortality rates. While Nebraska had 40% of its population fully vaccinated by April, 2021, Japan didn't cross that milestone until approximately four months later by August, 2021. But despite the velocity of vaccinations in the early days, Japan now boasts 37% more fully vaccinated than Nebraska and 82% more boosted than Nebraska. Additionally, Japan saw a 2.5 times lower case rate and an eight times lower mortality rate. So plainly, it appears the risk of dying from COVID-19 in Japan over the duration of the pandemic was much lower than the risk of dying from COVID-19 in Nebraska. And as we explored each of these specific topics in our virtual and in-person meetings, I began to see different themes emerge around unique Japanese successes and challenges in pandemic response. One theme that I'd like to borrow more of for Nebraska was the ability of Japanese government to include both public and private academic subject matter experts to inform guidance and public communications. The governmental COVID-19 advisory boards included economists and private academic subject matter experts, in addition to qualified public and governmental staff. And I think Japan's three C's communication was successful globally and it is still in use during surges in Nebraska. It seems that communications were more powerful because of greater collaboration between public, governmental, and private academic professionals. Bringing everyone to the table made this happen and made it stick. And that's something I wanna do more of in Nebraska. Another key theme that was critical was maintaining consistent communications and guidance from beginning to the end. The US changed guidance around masking, changed guidance around quarantine for vaccinated individuals twice. And as far as I can tell, Japanese guidance around masks and around exposures has been very consistent. And it's very appropriate to update communications and guidance when updated science requires it. But taking that into account, guidance should stay as consistent as possible for simplicity, for perceived integrity and for effectiveness. And the three C's is just, a good, just as good of a tool now as it was at its inception. And it's just as good of a tool for other respiratory viruses as it is for COVID-19. And while US guidance might sometimes be lost in complexity, individuals even in Nebraska still remember the three C's. So while success was found in clear and consistent guidance, success was also found despite the absence of restrictive governmental interventions. So while parts of the US and parts of the world forcefully shut down segments of communities, lockdowns, Japanese law precluded a similar approach. And I think it's in this combination of factors where a key lesson might be found for future pandemic response. Despite the absence of lockdowns, Japanese mortality remained low. It appears clear and consistent guidance when adopted by a critical mass of the population can be effective even in the absence of strict lockdowns. Mask wearing was everywhere when we joined. In our meetings, in hotels, streets, and restaurants we went to, more than two years into the pandemic. And vaccination rates are some of the highest in the world. And those are strong arguments. You can bend the curve when people buy in and when they know what to buy into. Clear, consistent guidance delivered to a population willing to receive that guidance appears to be a winning combination for producing uniquely low mortality rates during a respiratory virus pandemic. And low mortality rates in the setting of limited restrictive governmental interventions should be our target and should be the principal measure of success for a pandemic response. So while my perception is Japan is achieving that goal, challenges did still exist in operationalizing some components of response. 
Testing capabilities were delayed and overall testing throughput remains lower than similar nations. Faxes are frequently used to report laboratory results and track vaccination administrations in lieu of electronic reporting. Antigen tests still require PCR confirmations and local health departments are unable to administer vaccine themselves, which all falls to clinics and hospitals to do and that ties up valuable clinical resources. So despite these perceived challenges, the principal measures of success remain the same. Japanese mortality rates remain low in absence of restrictive interventions. So I've very much enjoyed the diverse meetings from Japanese governmental, academic, clinic, and media experts. And I'm incredibly thankful for the experts' time and willingness to share, as well as for our host, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, the huge amount of time and resources that uh, went in bringing this delegation together. CETA has been rewarding both personally and professionally for me. And in addition to these professional lessons I've been speaking about personally, I was able to visit a part of the world I never visited before, and I was able to carefully and with a mask interact with a culture that placed great value on community and public health. And I was able to be refresh, refreshed in the midst of fellowship and shared experience with my international colleagues. So wrapping up, as important as these professional lessons and personal rewards were, the connections I've made are equally important, and I now have direct connections to local and national Japanese public health and clinical experts. And I will lean on those connections in the future. I think by connecting in person, we were able to make longer lasting relationships. And through those connections, we can understand the diversity in pandemic public health response. Through understanding the different successes and failures, I think we can build a better future capable system. And there is global solidarity in the need for refocusing and supporting public health to build the effectiveness and resilience that is required on a larger scale. And I think Sasakawa Peace Foundation and Seed Public Health Delegation are helping address that need. Thank you all for your time. Happy to take questions later. Dr. Donahue, thank you very much for your kind work for uh, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese uh, uh, response to COVID-19 and uh, uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. So thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Evans, uh, uh, please begin. Thank you um, for having me uh, this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. I'm very excited to continue interacting with Saskawa Peace Foundation USA. It's been a delightful experience, um, and I hope to send more colleagues to you in the future. Um, this morning, um, I am going to be focusing on my key takeaways from our meetings um, and some ideas for future US-Japan collaboration. I do need to start with a disclaimer that the views, opinions, and findings that I express today are mine alone and should not be interpreted as representing the official views or policies of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the U.S. government. Um, my observations um, that I'm going to talk about today focus on three policy topics that tended to be recurring themes for us uh, during our conversations, both in meetings with, um, with our Japanese counterparts, and um, we had lots of conversations on the bus as we traveled around Tokyo um, and kept coming back to some of these themes. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about them today. Um, the first topic is uh, research and research and emergency response, particularly, um, which is somewhat of a paradox. Evidence-based research is vital, um, as Dr. Donahue said, to improving health outcomes in disaster response, but it's ethically and practically difficult to conduct during disaster situations. During response operations, funding, personnel, materials, and other resources are, by definition, overwhelmed and allocating part of these overwhelmed resources to research can improve outcomes for future response operations, but may not necessarily support public health and medical outcomes of current disaster victims. Disaster situations do provide an opportunity though for retrospective data collection on changes in health status because of disaster situations. Even if medical providers can't share chart information Billing codes can be used to assess how healthcare needs change or stay the same during and after disasters. This could potentially provide data for analysis that compares populations that are similar but differ in the extent to which they were exposed to a disaster or disaster countermeasures. More specifically, um, this creates an opportunity to retrospectively analyze how different um, interventions work in different areas and with different populations. 
this retrospective analysis reduces the burden of resources on response operations, and if done concurrently with drawn out disasters like COVID, it could be done potentially remotely. Strict data standards would be needed to protect patient privacy. Additionally, data collection would need to be standardized across patient care sites in a way that does not burden medical care providers or support staff, which was a concern that we heard several times. Um, this would be easier if data collection was a routine part of patient care and if it was automated in the charting or billing process. Considerations would be needed for instances of severe power disruption that inhibit electronic medical record keeping, but this research planning should be part of a larger disaster response planning. Um, one particular aspect that I think that the U.S. can learn a lot from Japan on um, is around using billing codes for disaster research. The United States primarily uses a multi-payer system that has some elements of single-payer health insurance, and Japan, as we know, has a single-payer system. But during COVID, we saw the U.S. add more single-payer elements, particularly around COVID-related health care. And I would love to see greater collaboration um, in understanding what policies could improve data collection and retrospective research during disasters um, based on the Japanese system. The next topic um, that I want to talk about um, is sort of federal agencies and communication of branding of federal agencies. It was really interesting to listen to experts in Japan talk about um, their desire and, and function to create a Japanese CDC. And at the same time, my own agency, which is currently called the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, was undergoing a rebranding and a renaming um, from our previous name, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And there were some key themes that we talked about in um, how to brand and start up agencies. Um, and the, the common concern that I work with in my job is how do we detangle what the agency is legally required to do with what the agency is expected to do by the public with what it actually does um, and how it fits into the response activities. And so we were able to have some great conversations around a need to organize agencies in an easily recognized um, information streams um, and have clear organization charts that outline the mission and the scope of each agency and how they uh, work together and how they communicate together. And this information of how agencies work together um, needs to be communicated to all levels of the government and with community stakeholders um, to effectively disseminate um, that information so that local actors and local response operations know where to find their touch points, both for information and for um, resource sharing. The third theme that I wanted to talk about is timing um, and how to set policy to start and stop disaster response. Um, by definition, disasters end when resources um, are no longer overwhelmed. But in practice, we know this is much less simple. Um, in the US, we deal with questions around um, what to do when a community started in an overwhelmed state, um, like we saw with some hurricane responses. Do you stop at baseline where the community was when the disaster hit? Do you stop when the community can withstand a repeat of the disaster? Is it somewhere in the middle? Is it somewhere else? Um, other policy concerns uh, revolve around slow turning disasters like heat emergencies and recurring flooding. How do we prioritize disaster preparedness? Is it by the number of people we expect to be impacted? Is it by the likelihood that it might happen again? Um, it was really interesting to speak with our Japanese counterparts about um, inf the infectious disease law that um, sort of dictated when some response activities were gonna start um, and then also pivot to exit strategies. We're now shifting um, in many places of the world from COVID pandemic to COVID endemic. Um, and that shift um, has been a struggle in some places. Um, and I think some of our preparedness planning needs to focus more on how to do that endemic shift and set up similar structures for non-infectious disease disasters. Flooding may be a hundred year flood event that happens in the United States, but we know that flooding is happening more and more often. And so we need increased funding and programs 
for transition of resources from emergency response to endemic or prolonged programming to care for these recurring disasters. Um, so the next thing that I was asked to talk about was a couple of ideas for future US-Japan collaboration. Um, the first thing I'd really love to see is joint research projects on public health and patient outcomes related to disaster events. And that goes back to my first um, point about using retrospective data collection to understand how medical countermeasures and other emergency preparedness interventions impact health outcomes. Um, I'd also like to see a continued exchange of personnel to facilitate relationship building and expose staff to new ideas and preparedness options. Um, I kept saying throughout the trip, study abroad for professionals should be way more of a thing. Um, and then finally, I would really like to see collaborative capability-based analysis of gaps in joint US-Japan preparedness mission space. Disasters may be located in one country, but we've seen how the cascade of effects turns global very quickly. And analyzing these local mission gaps and international mission gaps can help us better aid our global neighbors. So with that, um, I will turn it back to our hosts and thank you very much for your attention and your time. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for your clear and systematic uh, uh, remarks, as well as uh, uh, concrete uh, recommendations for United States and Japan in the future. Now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Natalie de Graff uh, uh, to talk about uh, uh, her observations on uh, your Japan uh, uh, cooperation in the future, as well as uh, uh, um, you know takeaways from uh, her trip to Japan. So uh, Natalie. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. And uh, good evening to those coming in, calling in from Japan. Um, I want to start off with saying thank you for the opportunity to speak with um, everyone, you know, and, and speak here today. In fact, um, I, you know, even more thank you to the amazing team with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation uh, for the opportunity to join this fellowship program and contribute to the US-Japan collaboration. Um, you know, I've traveled the world many times over throughout the course of my career, but never experienced uh, such a robust week of deep conversations with a clear focus on, you know, reevaluating norms and um, learning from each other and imagining a future that builds a stronger public health system. Um, so I was thinking I would start my time here today by first underscoring the commonalities of our two nations public health threats um, and then move into key takeaways uh, from the trip to Japan and then just finish out with future collaborations between the United States and Japan. So uh, super high level here, but a couple of the commonalities that I noticed and really as I looked through all of the conversations, um, it was clear that throughout the trip, um, there were several common themes that emerged during discussions that highlighted several areas overarching, you know, policy areas really, where the United States and Japan share, you know, common interests. Um, particularly, uh, the focus on economic security with the rule-based economic order, um, also countering economic statecraft, um, and building security to counter emerging threats through, you know, cybersecurity or public health supply chain resilience or emerging technology and intellectual property. Um, we all know that a stronger U.S. relationship, U.S.-Japan relationship, you know, can build stability and health security while upholding the universal values that both nations share. Um, and like Japan, the United States has been focusing a lot on building bilateral and multilateral relationships to ensure visibility into the global intel supply chain and information gathering capability for disease spread. Um, we all can agree that early knowledge of disease is the underpinning of pandemic preparedness. Um, additionally, both nations will really I guess kind of all nations across the globe, um, we're forced to make decisions during periods of uncertainty with imperfect information and learning a little bit more about how Japan approached that versus the United States was a really interesting conversation and takeaway that, that I, um, I really enjoyed having those conversations. I also want to emphasize, you know, how impressed I am with Japan's ability to relate their population's values and speak to those through the public health response, you know, first focusing on making major changes within the healthcare system to keep elderly populations safe, being able to convert certain hospitals into just being for the elderly, um, working with the private sector hospitals, really reevaluating the system itself and saying, what do we have to do to make sure that things that we value are safe and secure? And I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate that understanding that the population would be fine wearing masks, whereas in the United States, we had a much different approach because you know, we had a lot of people that didn't wanna wear masks. And so I think um, I was just really impressed with how the, the Japanese government understood its population and understood what they valued and were able to speak to that through public policy. And that's really, you know, 
uh, textbook example of like success in my mind from a public health uh, perspective. Um, and just some few things that I know that we're working on. So again, I'm with ASPR, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response within Health and Human Services. And so Health and Human Services is this broad umbrella. You know, we have an Office of Global Affairs. And so I reached out to them to try to understand what are some of the things that the United States government is focusing on with Japan and learn a little bit more about that and speak to that today. So I know that for over 50 years, the US and Japan have collaborated on health under the US-Japan Cooperative Medical Sciences Program. Um, this has been focusing on critical areas such as immunology, AMR, infectious disease, cancer, advanced technologies, and aging research. Um, and we accomplished this collaboration through many mechanisms, including exchange of expertise through liaisons, as well as formal bilateral and multilateral platforms forms. Um, we are very grateful uh, that we have finally our seventh liaison from the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. Um, and I wish I would have known because I would have had them on today. Uh, I just found out yesterday. But um, Japan has a, had a continuous liaison presence at ASPR since 2016. And that's pretty impressive, even through COVID, which has been an invaluable um, in terms of collaboration throughout COVID-19. And it continues to grow in scope um, in the post-COVID uh, world. So um, the liaison engages across all parts of ASPR. And you know, this might seem like a mundane you know, daily sharing of information uh, and engagement, but it accomplishes a whole lot. And it allows us to engage quickly and at the technical level to new events and threats. Um, and so just as a side note here, the Diamond Princess would not have been possible without this engagement um, as three former liaisons to ASPR were key players in the US deployment for NDMS and bringing about um, uh, medicines into Japan under compassionate use for early Americans and Japanese nationals infected with COVID. Um, and so from that in 2021, the post um, Diamond Princess, ASPR and Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare hosted a five part virtual tabletop exercise focusing on the experience and challenges of deploying ASPR responders to Japan. So besides HHS though, the broader interagency from the United States was engaged in that exercise, including Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and Department of Transportation. And they all participated, which really allowed us to understand you know, how we can work a little bit more seamlessly together in the future. Um, post the exercise, uh, the Office of Global Affairs and HHS in general are working on finalizing an SOP for deployment uh, to ensure smoother future response. Um, and an in-person uh, US-Japan DMAT to DMAT exercise is planned for 2023, which is really impressive. And I'm happy to learn that's gonna be taking place. Um, this year, ASPR facilitated uh, the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare sending a separate liaison to the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, so it's called the NETAC, which ASPR funds, um, whose mission is to increase the capability of the U.S. public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage special pathogens, which will hopefully increase Japan's work and our collaboration in that area. Um, and what we learned about during our, our trip, but what was emphasized here again, is that ASPR BARDA and the AMED SCARDA have had multiple engagements with more planned. Um, the new SCARDA director, Dr. Hamaguchi, uh, spoke on a panel with the PDAS Bratcher Bauman uh, at the US Japan Health Dialogue. And also Dr. Uh, Gary Disbrow from BARDA talked to AMED and the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare uh, staff in June and at the US Japan Medical Biodefense Research Symposium in August. So this is just an example of some of the ongoing collaborations that we have and how there's a lot more planned, um, but this is the first time we've held that in person since 2019 and we're really excited about that. Um, the delegation visited CDC for two days as well after the DC meetings, which again is new collaboration and I understand from our Japan counterparts that we may be even having a uh, Japanese liaison to CDC as well. Um, but for ASPR, you know, we plan to continue holding the Biodefense Symposium in person, uh, meeting annually, as well as at least one mini virtual symposium a year. And that will be in partnership with our US NIAD, um, CDC, uh, Homeland Security, and Office of Science Technology Policy at the White House. And this covers a wide range of topics based on specific lines of engagement for that year. A couple other things that we're working on with Japan, we're working to um, evolve some of our bilateral engagements with Japan into, multi into multilateral engagements um, and linking with other like-minded international partners um, to, to improve uh, uh, support for the Pacific Islands. And as part of the 100 day missions, which I know was mentioned several times during our, our week in Japan, uh, I understand there's going to be a quad uh, pandemic preparedness exercise uh, number one, which is supposed to examine information sharing, uh, targeting uh, public health solutions and intergovernmental relationships associated with an early warning signal and initial spread of novel pathogen with pandemic potential. And this goes back to what I initially started talking about, about you know how do you make decisions in uncertainty? And I think part of that is 
we share information a little bit better and get those early warnings a little sooner. So the tabletop exercise will examine senior officials' decisions in the context of each quad nation's domestic policies and legal frameworks, um, and then the uh, regional relationships, uh, including ASEAN, and global frameworks, including the World Health Organization, international health regulations. And the exercise will look at the hypothetical emergence of a highly pathogenic, naturally occurring novel biological threat. So these are just a couple examples of some of the things that we're working on you know, with Japan and plan to work on in the future. Um, and we really look forward to those engagements and building those out. I think there's always an opportunity to build in all of those different areas to make sure that our response in the future um, is more closely aligned with that from our international partners. So thank you so much again for my time here today. Well, thank you very much for your uh, articulated uh, um, information uh, packed uh, uh, remarks. And uh, uh, I couldn't take all the notes, but uh, um, I learned uh, a lot from uh, your remarks. So thank you very much. And you are one of the uh, active uh, participants in all the uh, discussions. And I appreciated your contribution during the trip. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sakamoto for her commentary. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the floor today. And then thank you also for the all the excellent presentation. And I'm very happy to know that each of you learned a lot and then had a great time in Japan. I myself learned a lot by partly participating in the seed workshop here in Japan. So thank you very much. So uh, as all of three already pointed out, this pandemic has had a very large impact on the society the like of which we have never experienced before. So in Japan, as Dr. Mashu pointed out, despite the large number of older population and the very high urban density, we have succeeded in the keeping the number of this per population relatively low. On the other hand, Japan lags behind in research and development of the medical countermeasures, such as vaccines for the COVID-19, which is a key to countermeasures against infectious diseases. And then I recognize that this is an area that need to be strengthened to prepare for the future pandemics. I think that every country, both Japan and the US, has a successful areas and then areas for the future improvement. And I think it is very important to have this kind of opportunity to learn from each other. Or this, this kind of opportunity to learn from each other. So briefly, I'd like to make a comment to the each presentation. For the first speaker, uh, Dr. Mashu spoke from the state level perspective. So he mentioned the relatively low number of the deaths without strong intervention, such as lockdown in Japan. I think it is a combination of several factors rather than a single factor. And I would like to discuss this at uh, this hour uh, throughout this my commentary. In terms of the state level perspective, I would like to make one point regarding the establishment of the local healthcare system. As in Japan, the central government and the Ministry of Health determine the general framework of the infectious disease control countermeasures, but the detailed implementation is basically left to the local government. Not only does the infectious situation differ from region to region, but also the available medical resources also differ among the regions, and the tailored countermeasures must be taken according to the local conditions. In Japan in particular, how to increase the number of hospital beds for COVID-19 in the face of the rapid, in rapid increase of the infected? At the same time, how to continue medical treatment for other diseases than COVID-19 were very important tasks left to the local government. In Japan, it is not easy for the public sector to reorganize the hospital bed with strong authority, especially since majority of the medical institutions are privately owned. In such a situation, each local government established a regional medical care delivery system by making full use of the network of medical institutions that each region has in the normal times. I think it is very important from the perspective for preparing for the future pandemic to build a medical care delivery system for the entire region that includes the reorganization of the hospital bed, the compensation of the necessary human resources, and the continuation of the medical treatment other than COVID-19. For the second presentation, Ms. Kesselin spoke from the national perspective. As I said at the beginning, Japan has been able to keep the number of this population relatively low 
despite its high population of aging and another factors. And there are various reasons for this, but I think one of them, one of the main key factor is that we were able to identify high risk situation from the very early stage. In other words, that in conversation in the close proximity in the crowded and poorly ventilated places poison high risk. And that the government were able to communicate this concept to the public in a very easy to understand manner. I think one of the success factors is that these scientific findings were promptly reflected in the policy. And furthermore, the public was educated about it in an easy to understand manner, and the preventive actions were encouraged at a very early stage. In addition, their organization called the public health centers throughout Japan. I think the I no one pointed out about the law of public health in Japan, public health center in Japan. But for a long time before the COVID-19, these public health centers have played a central role in the fight against infectious diseases in Japan. Although there are some challenges, such as the fact that IT technologies was not fully utilized, resulting in the considerable burden and inefficiency on the staff at the public health centers, I would like to mention that the public health centers played a major role during the COVID-19 pandemic. As mentioned in the uh, Dr. Mashu's presentation about the uh, usefulness of the retrospective contact tracing, I think the contribution of the public health centers that carefully carried out this kind of the statutory work was not very significant. Also in the crisis response, it is important not only for being well equipped with the response management to emergencies, but also to prepare for such emergencies during the normal time are crucial. In Japan, the importance of the infectious disease control has been declining in recent years due to the changes in the structures of the diseases. And the budget and the personnel at public health centers have tended to be reduced. However, looking back on the recent, recent crisis, I feel that it is once again important to allocate adequate budget for the preparedness during the normal times in order to have an ability to respond flexibly and quickly to the emergencies. I also would like to emphasize the fact that healthcare system during the normal time contributed to the better response for the pandemic. I think everyone knows that in Japan, a universal insurance system was established in 1961, which basically allows anyone living in Japan to receive medical care at a local payment rate. During the COVID-19, this universal health insurance system has enabled people to visit medical facilities without hesitation for the payment from the very early stage. And I believe that this equitable medical system is one of the reasons why the number of deaths in Japan has remained relatively low. The medical system that Japan has in place, even in normal time, had a positive effect on the COVID-19 control. And once again, central government plays an important role in maintaining the system, this kind of healthcare system during peacetime. But in building and maintaining such system, it is important to assume that it will also be useful during the emergencies. Finally, for the Ms. Natalia's presentation, she spoke about the uh, key takeaways and then also for the uh, future possible collaboration between Japan and the United States. I strongly agree the point that the future collaboration she raised during her presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, I believe that every country has both part that work and that both good and then not good part. And I also believe that even after the end of the COVID-19, there will surely be another pandemic on the global scale. In order to prepare for the, such a pandemic, I think it is very important for both countries to cooperate and learn from the each other. I personally believe that the following two areas will be a key areas for the strengthening Japan and US collaboration in the area of the infectious diseases. One is the intelligence function for the infectious diseases, and the other one is the research and development of the uh, medical countermeasures and its manufacturing and distribution. The first part is about an intelligence function. The possibility of the new virus emerging is an increasing due to the climate change and several other factors. And how to detect the emergence of the G's new virus is very important, both for minimizing the damage in the early stage and then also for the research and development of the uh, novel countermeasures. Of course, we already have a global intelligence function, such as WHO, the IHR, 
but I believe that intelligence function that complement this is essential. In particular, taking into account that most of the pandemics to date have originated in the Asian region, and that Japan is geographically located in Asia, I think it is necessary for Japan and US to collaborate and to work together to strengthen the intelligence functions, especially in the Asian regions. Another area that will require collaboration in the future is the research, development, production, and distribution of the medical countermeasures, including vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. At the UK G7 summit in 2021, the 100 days mission was announced, which aimed to conduct research and development of medical countermeasures in 100 days during the next pandemic. This 100 days mission includes not only the basic research part, but also includes in clinical trials, regulatory approval, and then manufacturing and equitable distribution of those, those measures to meet global demand. The rapid availability of medical countermeasures is a matter directly related to the lives of the people of the country. And it is of the most important to ensure that those MCMs is available earlier in the next pandemic. Various types of vaccines have been developed and manufactured for the COVID-19, but none of them can be completed in a single country. For example, many of the raw materials for the pharmaceuticals are originated from the China. In addition, many countries are conducting global joint clinical trials and manufacturing, and in order to meet global demand, they are outsourcing, outsourcing manufacturing to other countries for large-scale productions. Unfortunately, Japan has not succeeded in developing an effective domestic vaccines as of today, but I feel that there's still room for Japan to contribute for the supply chain of medical countermeasures, including clinical trials and manufacturing. In addition to the 100 days mission, in addition, the 100 days mission is to deliver medical countermeasures to the people as quickly as possible. At the same time, since securing medical countermeasures is a matter directly related to the security and economic issues, the necessity of completing the supply chain of medical countermeasures among like-minded countries is quite important. So the US and Japan have been deepening their collaboration and cooperation, not only bilaterally, but also in the various other places, such as G7 and Quad already. And next year, Japan will chair the G7. I hope that this various occasion will be used to foster a deepen collaboration between the US and Japan in this area. So thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. Thank you. Well, Dr. Sakamoto, thank you very much for, as usual, very thoughtful comment on a wide range of things, as well as uh, uh, responding uh, specifically to uh, uh, each of our uh, uh, three uh, presenters, and also uh, pointed out some of the strategic uh, element in uh, uh, tackling uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, disease uh, um, in collaboration between Japan and the United States. So thank you very much. And we are delighted to uh, have you uh, join us as a uh, uh, senior fellow uh, uh, for Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. So we're looking forward to working with you. So thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, uh, three speakers, whether they have uh, any response to uh, uh, Dr. Sakamoto's comment. I, I do have a couple. I appreciated uh, uh, two different comments and I'd love to respond to them. Um, I love the, the exchange so much. There, there's two main themes for me, I think. One was the flexibility of local response within national direction in Japan. And then the other was the difficulty in interfacing with hospitals given that private ownership. And despite that difficulty, some success is there. So both of these comments resonate with me and our local response in Nebraska. Um, flexibility within that local response is something that's been important to us e equally, but it's dependent on our systems, right? And it's limited by these manual processes that, that require automation. So I think data modernization must play a central role in both US, in Nebraska, and in Japan for health preparedness and for future pandemic preparedness moving forward. If we're tied up, sending and interpreting faxes, treading water while we're trying to move papers, difficult to innovate and push forward. And that's something that we must work on here. Um, and, and that solidarity, and this is something that's difficult that we both have to be working on, uh, was, a, was another takeaway. And that makes me wanna focus uh, focus on it more closely. The other point about uh, difficulty in interfacing with with hospitals, given that private ownership. I think in the U.S. we have a 
uh, we've had a lower degree of difficulty getting that hospital buy. And I think because from a national perspective, Medicare and Medicaid remains the primary insurer and thus the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services in the US CMS, they exercise some degree of control over most hospitals, even private hospitals in the US and in Nebraska. But despite that lower degree, I think one of the greatest challenges as far as hospitals have gone from my perspective, uh, one of the greatest challenges shared between Japan and Nebraska and, and the US is tracking COVID-19 hospitalizations. That emerged as a critical indicator of pandemic severity and protecting hospital capacity became a key guiding principle for us in the Nebraska pandemic response. So entering into the pandemic, we had really no national system to accurately track hospitalizations. And I think that was similar to Japan. So while work is ongoing, neither country to my knowledge has yet to create an effective automated national hospital surveillance system. And that remains a critical goal and need. Something else that we must do before another pandemic and something that we might be able to do together. Thank you very much. Catherine or uh, Natalie, do you have any response to uh, Haruka's uh, comment? Um, mostly just wanted to uh, thank everyone uh, for having us here. The, the ability to continue these conversations back and forth um, has been great. And uh, I will fully admit that digesting some of the information sometimes takes a little bit of time, um, but I love that our conversations keep coming back to similar themes of we need to understand our data, we need to understand how we can access it and implement it into our um, our, med our disaster planning. Um, and honestly, that, that was the biggest and most immediate takeaway that I had from the trip is data analysis, data collection um, needs to be standardized, um, not necessarily centralized, but it needs to be set up so that the data becomes accessible while still maintaining um, patient privacy. So that's been a, 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 an encouraging theme to hear continue through this conversation. Thank you. Natalie. Yeah, so I wanted to um, thank Dr. Sakamoto because I, I appreciated your comment again about the 100 days mission. I know that was mentioned several times during uh, our week there and um, focusing on those bilateral and multilateral uh, agreements, as well as, you know, there's also talk of a global framework for response, right? Um, and building that out. And I think that's something that we can all work on together. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question from the audience. What is a key takeaway that you are able to apply to your work and put into practice almost immediately since you returned from the SEED program trip to Japan? Anybody? I mean, I can jump in there. So I came back and I um, I had to go almost immediately over to uh, another week long meeting um, that was focused on information sharing and intel during the pandemic. And so being able to take the conversations that I had while in Japan with all the different delegations and expertise um, and hear common themes as well within the United States. And there were several other countries there, you know, and being able to say, well, this is not unique to just us here, right? And being able to pull that perspective in um, as well as different ways and, and understanding that there are a lot of countries who want to do more information sharing and how do we go about making that happen? What's the next step there? Um, so definitely was something that, you know, the perspectives and information that was shared was certainly applied and helped shape my thinking that following week. And so I'm very appreciative for that. Thank you very much. Catherine or Matthew, anything from your viewpoint? Happy, happy to jump in. You know, one major theme of my takeaway what was about that importance and consistency of messaging, right? If you create a good enough message, a good enough communication tool in the beginning that's based on the science and you stick to it, that, that might that might help foster uh, you know, belief in the integrity of your science. And as soon as I returned from Japan, from Seed, this slapped me in the face with, with monkeypox. So it's like with monkeypox, there's been great debate in how we communicate how it's being transmitted. Is it a disease transmitted through close contact? Is it a disease transmitted through sexual contact? Um, and even in public health circles, this is debated how we communicate around this. Right off the bat, when we began talking about monkeypox in Nebraska, um, we let people know this is a disease spread through close contact. This is not a sexually transmitted infection. When I have a patient with monkeypox, they need to uh, isolate and they need to make sure that 
no one's exposed to any of these lesions, right? Not just lesions specifically on, on genitals. So there seemed to be a movement and transition over to calling it an, a sexually transmitted infection. The science, by definition, it's transmitted through close contact. And I think after reflecting on our time in Japan and re reflecting on the importance of consistency in messaging, I chose to stick with that original message, which is backed by science. And I think which is the, the best the best public health communication to be uh, using for monkeypox transmission at the moment. Um, and that was directly reflective of the immediate lessons that we took away from our time in Japan. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. So the, um, as I touched on earlier, the greatest or the most immediate um, item that I took back to my team was um, employee professional development training. This opportunity is not something that our office has participated in before. Um, and as a uh, an office, our office is only existed at, at, in its smallest, you know, seven person team member um, for a couple of years. And our team greatly values interdisciplinary understanding and collaboration. Each of us on the team have different educational backgrounds and experiences that we bring into imagining how medical countermeasures can be used or policies can be used for disaster response operations. And every bit of additional exposure and education that we get adds to our value as a team and adds to the value of our agency. And so I was able to immediately recommend um, greater international um, studies for our team. We spend a lot of time, obviously our policy is focused on United States operations, but again, with COVID, we saw how quickly a local disaster impacts the world, whether it's a supply chain disruption or personnel disruption um, and greater international understanding, I think uh, will greatly improve our team's um, efficacy and um, ability to further the mission. Thank you very much. Our uh, trip to Japan was delayed uh, uh, over a year because of COVID-19. And originally, uh, we are trying to focus on uh, US-Japan uh, response to uh, a Diamond Princess. And uh, uh, one of the unique uh, uh, meetings that we had now while we are in Japan was local uh, um, meeting with the Kanagawa Prefecture. In terms of uh, this flexibility between uh, national, nationally oriented policy and locally oriented uh, uh, practices, you know, uh, what's the takeaway from uh, uh, this meeting with the uh, Kanagawa Prefecture Office? I would uh, uh, pose this question to uh, uh, Matthew, but uh, welcome uh, uh, comment from uh, Natalie and uh, Catherine, if you have any. Uh, very, very happy to. And that was one of the most rewarding meetings for me, I think. Um, one, one takeaway that I had from that, so it, it was greatly beneficial for me, not to just see the successful strategies, but also the struggles. And I highlighted some of those in my, my original presentation, the issues with, with faxes that remain and the need for data modernization. I think one of the, the successes and one of the lessons from that meeting was about uh, prescriptions for antiviral drugs like Nermatrovil, Ritonavir, or Molnupiravir. Um, I think they, our conversation is mostly centered around Paxlovid or the Nermatrovir, Ritonavir product. Um, and the success of having a standing prescription, even at a local level, is something that we've not been able to emulate here. It's much, uh, it's much more difficult to access that prescription drug, which is a critical component of our ongoing COVID-19 response. The community's general access to antiviral medications like Paxlovid. Um, and my takeaway was that it was much easier to access uh, this key component of response, this medication, because of a standing prescription. Um, and, and that was an important thing that I that I got out of that meeting that I'm hoping to do more of here. Thank you. And Thank I can, you. oh, sorry, yeah. I can have some takeaways too. You know, I really loved that meeting because I enjoyed when they had the diagram up on the presentation and learning about here's the national system for how we're supposed to be doing this, but locally that may not work and it's impeding and burdening the system. And how do we change that within the bounds of what we can 
to be able to make it functional for the people who need it and to streamline that process so we're not overwhelming the system. And that shows that flexibility of the systems to be able to adapt, as I was talking about earlier, to like what the people, like understanding the people and what they can do, what the system can do, and how do you match those up really nicely. So I think it's a great example of, um, of that flexibility that we wanna see during a response. Thank you. Catherine, do you have any observation? Um, honestly, Natalie and Matthew hit on everything that I would have said. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one of the um, things that uh, I noticed uh, uh, in many of the meetings that we have is almost like this relief on the part of a Japanese expert or a, a sense of, a, a, you know, acknowledgement that, that they appreciate it because uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, felt like they are underappreciated. Uh, despite the uh, uh, great success that uh, uh, Japan has in terms of uh, uh, battering, uh, uh, battering uh, uh, COVID-19. Did you have uh, uh, that sense that, uh, uh, you know, Japanese exports uh, felt like they are underappreciated? And Matthew talked about the importance of communication with regard to, uh, uh, you know, uh, disease uh, 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 to the general public and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, what about... Uh, uh, communication as to the roles of a, a medical expert, a policy experts. Do, do you have any observation on that? So I can jump in on that one. Um, and there were, there were two ideas there that I wanted to hit on. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, did it seem like the Japanese experts felt appreciated for their role? And that was a question that I asked a couple of times in meetings. I asked, um, what are you doing about staff resiliency and protecting your public health responders as well as your medical responders? And I got varying answers. Um, obviously, a lot of the, the conversations we were having were with um, policy experts and at, at the federal government level. And I think one, one thing that I saw that I felt I also saw in talking to my US colleagues is this tendency to downplay the struggle of working in public health at, at the, not the front lines, at the, you know, you're at the rear lines of the response um, because we, we plan for resiliency and protecting our first responders and our frontline responders. But I've seen less planning for resiliency of the policy experts or it, just the general staff that exist um, that aren't interacting with patients that aren't interacting at the ground level. Um, and so I, I heard people say both in the U.S. side and on the Japan side, yes, we know we're appreciated, but we're exhausted. We're you know we're we're living and responding to a disaster at the same time. And when you are physically on the ground responding, you can physically remove yourself from your response venue, but especially when you're working from home and constantly thinking about how to solve problems. Um, I, th I think that's a challenge that we haven't adequately tackled is how to prevent burnout um, and improve resiliency among those um, public health responders. Thank you very much. And I can jump in on that as well, um, but you know, I always do jump in, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, listening to the conversations during that week, I think it, it was clear that there were some expert groups of experts that felt like they not were undervalued, but didn't have a strong enough voice in some of the policies that were made. Um, but I think some of that goes back to risk threshold, right? So we also met with some business uh, federation and you each have your own set of values. So if you're an expert in disease control, your risk threshold might be very low and your only job is to make sure that there's very little transmission of disease. Whereas if you're in the business side, you're an economist, their risk threshold might be higher and more tolerant of a certain amount of disease spread within the community. And so there was difference of opinions there. And I think that when they come together, that's the role of the government to decide as a nation, what's that risk threshold and, and how to move forward. Thank you. I don't think I could add anything more than what uh, Catherine and Natalie just did. Dr. Sakamoto, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, you are the only participant from Japan. Do you have any comment on uh, what we've been talking about here? Uh, you mean the relationship between the uh, policy professional expert and then the government? 
site. And also uh, uh, this issue of uh, uh, appreciation for the medical experts and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know uh, by the general public or the media mm -hmm. and so on and mm -hmm. so forth and how to uh, uh, keep the morale high and uh, you know sometimes uh, uh, medical professions professionals are overstretched and uh, uh, as uh, 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 Catherine uh, pointed out, you know. Mm. Yes, I think the I, mm, yes, I think this is an also very important agenda here in Japan. So like the, at the very beginning, of course, there's some appreciation from the general public to the healthcare professionals, but after the two and a half years, I mean, there's a kind of the uh, exhausted, I mean, general public and exhausted about the, any kind of the counter measures for the uh, COVID-19. And then sometimes criticism goes to the, uh, not only for the government, but sometimes go to the healthcare professionals. And then why those professionals put in a strict restriction on the general public? So, like, uh, communication between the our uh, general public and healthcare professional are key, even in Japan. But I think the our uh, this is a not really evidence based comment, but just not feeling uh, here in Tokyo. I feel like the general public are uh, still really appreciate the effort uh, made by the both the local government, central government, and then also the healthcare professionals. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, uh, uh, that was uh, um, this trip was your first time in Japan, and I believe uh, uh, Natalie was in Japan right before. And uh, uh, what about you, Catherine? Uh, this was my first trip to Japan. So uh, uh, first timers, uh, two first timers, and uh, uh, one veteran. But uh, uh, how you know part of uh, what we talked about is uh, uh, people's perception, culture politicization of uh, 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 some of the medical issues. Uh, there's a big difference between Japan and the United States, you know, and uh, 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 I think uh, not the, uh, everybody mentioned uh, mask wearing, but uh, uh, that's actually uh, uh, something Japan imported from the West, you know, and uh, uh, so there is some, some sort of education, some sort of adaptation going on, you know, and in terms of a uh, uh, relationship between uh, uh, you know, culture, loosely uh, uh, defined culture, uh, people's perception, um, you know, politicization of some of the uh, issues with regard to pandemic, you know. What are the most uh, 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 striking impression that you have about uh, uh, Japanese uh, 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 measures against uh, COVID-19? I would love to, to answer this question. Um, it's something uh, I'm going to put my cultural anthropology hat on, which was my first uh, degree. Um, the striking difference that I saw was that in Japan, you write a rule or a policy and you expect people to follow it. In the United States, you don't. You write a policy to promote behavior change so that people choose to do the thing that results in the actual change that you need. Um, and that that difference is so striking and um, presents very challenging problems on both sides. Um, and I very much enjoyed conversations talking about um, behavior change versus rule following between the two governments. Matthew, Natalie, I mean, any observations, any impressions? Yeah, that for, for my end, I mean, it, this is a strikingly different culture than Nebraska, right? And uh, it, in Nebraska, we've had, I, I know we already talked about mask wearing, but I think a lot of it centers around that and, and directly around public willingness to follow public health guidance. I mean, these are two completely different worlds in comparing uh, Japan and Nebraska and the public's uh, perception of public health guidance, right? And and there seems to be for for whatever reason, which is you know well beyond the scope of my uh, understanding, a much greater willingness to follow public health guidance, to follow uh, public health experts' recommendations, and it's that willingness, which is a which is a part of the culture, to listen to experts. I think which is what has produced some of these vastly different mortality rates. So I was very impressed with seeing that firsthand with continued you know, recognition and appreciation of public health guidance during our time there. Um, and it, it didn't seem just like a, a facade that people would go out and, and try to be careful for each other um, just to show off. I mean, it was truly a part of, uh, uh, of what we saw everywhere and it seemed to be of value. Um, more than just a more than just an action. 
that was very enjoyable. Anything, Natalie? Yeah, I mean, so I spent a lot of time in Asia and mask wearing, uh, you know, especially if you were feeling ill was not uncommon. I've seen it all over. Um, so that to me wasn't as surprising the conformity of that and adopting of that policy. Um, I was um, not whatever I, it was. It was um, I don't know what the word is. I noticed in Japan that we had taught, we'd had people talk about, there was a uh, not so clear messaging and it was almost a relief to see that it wasn't just the United States. I mean, we did it on a whole different scale. Don't get me wrong, but, um, and, and CDC has since come out and, you know, said it wasn't handled necessarily the best it could have been. Um, but it was also nice to hear that other countries that had rates that were so low were also struggling with that same thing. And, you know, public health 101 goes back to how the messaging, the, the public health communication and education of the public. And it was nice to see that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, even countries that had lower rates were still struggling with that as well. Um, and so, you know, that is still a key thing that we need to all work on um, together. And I, I think that there's a real role there for the international community uh, and multilateral organizations to work on that. Thank you. This is uh, uh, my layman's observation, but uh, um, this popular culture and effectiveness in uh, 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 fighting COVID-19, uh, I think there is a, a relationship between American leadership in the world that you have so many great scientists, institutions, CDC, HHS, and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, when you uh, uh, have difficulty controlling uh, uh, some of the basic uh, uh, behavior, and having a, a, a very high level of death and uh, infection and so on and so forth. You know, uh, there is a, a slight uh, a dent on American leadership uh, uh, in the international community uh, uh, as far as the uh, result is concerned. But uh, I hope I didn't uh, cross the line in uh, saying that. You know. We have uh, uh, three minutes left and uh, we have a great discussion. And I just want to uh, uh, give each participant uh, uh, one final word. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to actually begin with uh, uh, Dr. Sakamoto. Okay, yes. Thank you again for inviting me today. And then I said, I think both Japan and the US uh, had the both positive and then bad thing for the COVID-19 control. But I think it is very important to have this kind of workshop and then webinar to share the, our, our thoughts and then experience together and then to uh, well prepare for the future pandemic. So thank you very much. I'm very much looking forward to further deepening of collaboration in this area. Thank you. And I hope that uh, uh, you'll be able to come to Washington uh, uh, next <laughs> time, you know? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Matthew. Well, I wanna start by saying, I hope if anybody ever makes it to Nebraska, you please remember me and let me know that you're here. Um, I, I think I'll end on just highlighting some of our opportunities to build together. I mean, we must not lose sight of the challenges throughout the past two to three years, right? We, it's going to be very easy as deaths and hospitalizations are improved, as more and more are vaccinated moving forward to forget all of the struggles we've had. And I want to just highlight some of the opportunities that we have to, to build together. Retrospective contact tracing, we need to build better systems to make this easier so that we can continue it through surges like Omicron. Uh, in times where we couldn't even continue retrospective contact tracing, despite its known effectiveness. And rebuilding hospitalization surveillance, so we're more prepared to identify the diseases that are hitting people and moving them to the hospital as quickly as possible. And refocusing on data modernization, genomic epidemiology, and pushing the envelope in each of these areas. And uh, through our through our week with you and our pre-meetings, I think we've uh, I've identified those connections that at least I can can maintain contact with and continue building these things in Nebraska and continue learning from each other. So really appreciate the time. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Catherine. Thank you. Um, thank you again for having me today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you all again. Um, and I am looking forward to continuing a relationship where we can continue to maintain and educate our uh, early and mid-career public health professionals on international relations and not just how we're different, but how we are the same and the struggles that we can move forward in together. So thank you again for having me. Let us know if there are uh, um, anything that uh, uh, we may be able to uh, come up as a next uh, uh, program. To, uh, Absolutely, I have several ideas for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Natalie. 
Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this time today. So um, I'm going to echo Dr. Sakamoto's uh, comments and also say that um, I'm looking forward to all the upcoming uh, work that we're that we're already doing together between the US and Japan. Uh, again, I didn't have optics on that before. And now knowing that there's all this great work, but then seeing where there's new opportunities to be able to take it one step farther and deepen that relationship, um, particularly both bilaterally and multilaterally working together to achieve those um, values and norms that we all want. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, 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 we took up this uh, um, subject matter because uh, we thought that it's a timely subject matter, but uh, uh, because of the seriousness of COVID-19, it was delayed for a year. And as a matter of fact, it turned out to be great in the sense that uh, we were able to have a monthly you know, video call with the Japanese experts so that uh, it's almost like uh, uh, you have uh, one virtual trip to Japan and one uh, uh, real trip to Japan in person. You know, so. It, it's been a, a lot of work for us, uh, uh, to be honest with you. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Shanti uh, Shoji and uh, Dia Hanu for uh, uh, making it uh, reality. But uh, 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 I feel like uh, it was a worthwhile uh, program that uh, we tackled and uh, 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 participant uh, from the United States, as well as a uh, uh, Japanese counterpart like uh, Dr. Sakamoto uh, made an entire effort uh, 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 worthwhile. So uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, uh, let's make it uh, uh, as a first step and to see uh, what we can do next. So thank you very much for uh, uh, being with us this morning and thank you uh, uh, for Japanese people or uh, uh, experts uh, attending the event uh, despite the fact that it's late uh, uh, in the evening in Tokyo. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, close the event and thank you very much. Bye-bye.